We've come. We've come to give God the glory. To give God the glory. Oh yes, we've come. Oh yes, we've come to give Him praise. To give Him praise. We've come. We've come to give Him the honor. To give Him the honor. Let's magnify Him. Let's magnify Him. All of our ways. In all of our ways. Who are we? We're interceding. Christian Center. We hope that you felt welcome. From the time that you entered into the house of the Lord, come and receive His holy word. If you are a guest, be blessed. Father God, in the name of your Son, Jesus, we give you glory, praise, and honor. We thank you for your mercy and grace, which endures to all generations. We thank you for your new mercies that we received on this morning when we woke up. Because there's plenty, Lord God, who went to sleep on last night that did not wake up. But, Lord God, you've given us another opportunity, Lord God, to glorify you, to praise you, to honor you. You've given us another opportunity, Lord God, to propel your gospel to a dying world. Now, Lord God, we ask that your grace will continue to be in us. Your grace will continue to be around us. Your grace continue to be, be near us so that we can continue to carry out the things that you've called us to do. In the matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen, amen, amen. I'm just thanking God. Let's jump right into this Bible study. I have a lot of material that I want to cover on this evening. And I'm just thanking God for his, his mercy to give us to that point there. Amen. Um, in him, through him, and by him. Our base scripture is coming from Acts chapter 17, beginning in verse 28. And it says, for in him we live and move and have our being. <laughs> in him we live, move, and have our being. That's in him. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to review what we talked about over the last few weeks. We first talked about uh, in him. What does it mean to be in him? As I told you a few weeks ago, this is Paul was coming off of the famous Mars Hill speech where he was talking to the Athenians, the Greeks, who were philosophizing up on top of this hill. And Paul introduced them to the unknown God. Paul gave credence to his proclamation by saying, not only have you been worshiping created things, but the creator, the one who created you, is the only reason that you still live. The only reason you still exist. Oh, that ought to get someone excited because the only reason we still exist is because the Creator has created us and allows us to exist in Him, through Him, and by Him. Amen. Amen. Paul brought their attention to their futile efforts of worshiping stone and, and rocks and, and iron and wood and copper and, and gold. He, he brought to them how futile it was for them to do that. But Paul also took the time to ensure that he wouldn't offend anyone. And he said, in him we, meaning everybody, including Paul himself, had his being. In church today, we are included in that we. And in church today, we have many who, who do not claim, do not claim who they are in God because they don't recognize who they are in God. Amen. Many people claim to be in him. But their character states that they're not really in him. Uh, how can we be liars in him if he is the truth? How can we brawl, be brawlers and are the men of in him if he's the king of peace? Oh my God, my God. Romans 10 and 9 says this. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus or Jesus as Lord, from that first confession onward, we should build our lives around five things which puts uh, you firmly in him. There are five things that we have to confess and let it become a part of our very being, our very nature. What is God in Christ? What God in Christ has wrought for us in his plan of redemption? What God through the word and the Holy Spirit has wrought for us in the new birth in Christ through the infilling of the Holy Spirit? What we are to God the Father in Christ Jesus what Jesus is doing for us right now at the right hand of the Father forever making intercession for us. Glory to God. Thank God he's making intercession for me and you too. Five, what God can do through us or what his word can do through our lips. Hallelujah. 
Let's look at these things real, real briefly. Let's look at in him. Four things we also, we must know, realize, and do. We have to discover and recognize and fully accept our privileges in Christ. In the New Testament, you find 133 scriptures that point to who we are in Christ. It points to who we are in Christ. It says in him, it says in Christ, and in whom, and by him. Becoming a new creature in Christ, the second thing that we must know, realize, and do. It says in 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, If any man be in Christ, then he is a new creature. Behold, all things have passed away. All things are passed away. And behold, all things are new. Not just some things, but all things are new. There may be some symptoms of the old man that still hang around you, but if you stay in Christ long enough, you will be cleaned up. There may be some, some habits that you have that you want to leave, if you stay in Christ, and the deeper you go into Christ, the more these habits, these 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 desires will go away because you're in Christ. The third thing is redemption from the curse of the law. And the curse of the law is what we were born underneath. We were born underneath the curse of the law because we by nature are Adam's children. By nature we're Adam's children when we stay in the natural. We're Adam's seed, Adam's offspring. But when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we come from underneath the curse of the law and began to operate underneath the grace of Christ, which gives us the grace to grow in Him. In Him, my God, my God. And the fourth thing is deliverance from the power of Satan. When we were underneath the curse of the law, we were underneath the power of Satan. Satan could toy with us and do anything that he wanted to us because we were giving him legal rights to do certain things to us. But when we are in Christ, we come from underneath to from the power of Satan. We're delivered from his power that was in him, then through him. Let's review. John 14, 6, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but through me. No man comes unto the Father, but through me. Those same words were also were given for them, but also for everyone on earth. He was talking to his disciples. He gave those words for them, but he gave these same words unto us. So those who think they can deny Christ and still make it into the kingdom, you're very confused. You cannot deny him and make it into the kingdom. You can deny him in more ways than just as Peter denied him. You can deny him access to your life to be used uh, for his glory, to be used to bring other people into the kingdom. You can deny him that access and you are denying him. Listen, no new age guru, no Buddha, no Hare Krishna, no, no Confucius, no Muhammad. All those people are dead. But Jesus still lives. Jesus still lives. Jesus even said, he is the God of the living and not of the dead. So thinking you can get to life from what is dead, then you're confused. You have to go through life in order to get to the life. Ah, hallelujah. The emphasis the verse emphasizes three words, way, truth, and life. All those words are found through him. All those meaning of the words and, and, and such are found through him. Through him, trials, tribulations, and persecutions are put underneath your feet. Through him, we can grow while in contentment. We can be content with our situation, not satisfied, but content with our situation, and we're able to grow. If we get to a point where we cannot be content where we are, we can never build a foundation or the building blocks in order to really grow. Oh, hallelujah. Through him, we have victory. Because he has victory, he said, I have overcome the world. And we are in him, uh, and through him, we can overcome the world. The world did not give you joy, nor can the world take the joy away from you. It is him who gave you joy. Ha, hallelujah. Through him and his victory. Our greatest victory isn't really ours. It's him. 
It's through him that we have victory. And finally, let's get to the juice of everything here. Let's wrap all this stuff up. By him. We talked about in him. We talked about through him. Now let's talk about by him. John 1 and 3 says this. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything that was made. What a powerful statement. All things were made by him. And without him there was not anything that was made was made. <laughs> Hallelujah. He was in the world. This is John 1 and 10. He was in the world. And the world was made by him. And the world knew him not. Those are some scriptures I want to introduce to you so that you will understand exactly who Jesus is. He is the second part of the Godhead. He is incarnate in God when he came to the earth. Fully human, but yet fully God at the same time. Hallelujah. And, and the scripture that, that describes it tells us who Jesus was over 600 years or 700 years before he uh, came into the earth is some scriptures that's found a set of scriptures found in Isaiah 53 Isaiah 53 verse 1 says this who had believed our report and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed for he shall grow up before him as a tender root and as a root out of dry ground he had no form nor comeliness and when we shall see him there is no beauty that we should desire him He's despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely, goodness, he has borne our grief and carried our sorrows. Yet we did not esteem him smitten, stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we not were, not will be, but we are healed because of his stripes. So by him, by him, in that well-known scripture, we find the conglomeration of all Christ has done. All that Christ is doing and all that Christ is going to do for us. The description of our Lord in the scripture found in Isaiah 53 speaks to why he has a name above each and every name. Although his name was common back in that day, he yet has a name above each and every name. A common name because God wanted him to identify with the common people. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory unto God. The life and times of Jesus from his birth, his ministry, his death, and resurrection. In all the Gospels, we will not find it as well written as the prophet Isaiah wrote, explaining exactly who Jesus is. Let's examine those first three scriptures. Oh, I love it when we read Isaiah 53. The first three scriptures. Oh, my God. They, they're awesome. <laughs> Hallelujah. It says, who had believed our report? <laughs> The Lord was often questioned by many people, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, as well as others. They questioned exactly who Jesus was. They tried to get him to do politics one time, and he said that it does not matter what I show you, you're still going to reject me. You're only going to remember the two fish and five loaves of bread while your stomach is hungry and while your stomach is full. In other words, he was telling them, I'm not going to play up to you to convince you of who I am. You have to believe in who I am. So the height of people rejecting him, the height of this came when the people of Nazareth, the people of Bethlehem, the people of Galilee, where his family resided, rejected and doubted who he was, doubted his character. Rejection, though, was the greatest impact that he faced. But rejection is the greatest impact in any family situation. Whenever your family rejects you, you feel a certain kind of way. It's unexplainable. But notwithstanding rejection of 
uh, uh, Jesus felt a sense of rejection that was uh, similar to someone feeling as if their mother rejected them. But notwithstanding rejection of by a mother, uh, it crushes everything that's within you when a mother does reject you. Why? Because a mother tells you everything is going to be all right, even when everything does not look like it's going to be all right. A mother has a way of nurturing you, of, 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 of wrapping you up. A mother has a way of nuzzling you, a way of keeping you comfortable even when the world is not comfortable with you. A mother has a way where she will wrestle with anything in order to protect her child, uh, uh, but 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 a mother a mother muttering is the first form of affirmation that a child gets. The first form of affirmation that a child gets. Fathering is the solidification of that affirmation. But if there's any instability in either parent. Oh, that's a Bible study itself. Mother, mothering is, is the first affirmation. Father's the solidification. Amen. Uh, but if there's any instability in either parent, the foundation which they seek to build can be exploited by others. Huh? Others can exploit. If the parent doesn't do their job to help build that solid foundation in that child, they can be exploited by bullies or even siblings. Siblings can pick on them as the bad as bad as bullies can. That foundation is so important. This is why parents have to be very conscious of sibling rivalry. They have to be very conscious not to allow one sibling to cause another one to feel a certain kind of way. They have to be very careful. Now, there's always going to be a healthy amount of competitiveness between siblings, but stable, unfavoring affirmation, constant unfavoring affirmation of one child over another, it's the one way that you can kill a relationship with your children. It'll cause an injury that's so deep that the relationship will never be the same. It'll affect not only the relationship between that parent, uh, that parent and that child, but it'll affect the relationship between that child and anyone else that they ever encounter or attempt to be in a relationship with. But Jesus' rejection was profound. It was profoundly greater than mere everyday circumstantial rejection. It was profound. His rejection came not because he represented himself as Joseph did. When Joseph represented himself before his brothers, he said, I saw stalks of a wheat bowing down and, and I was the stalk of wheat that you were bowing down to. He said things that made them feel rejected. But Jesus wasn't doing that. He wasn't showboating, as, as we might say, uh, as Joseph represented himself in the Old Testament, uh, uh, nor, nor because the abundance of who he was wasn't realized among his family. He, his family didn't realize who he was. Jesus' rejection was soul-rendering, especially since his mother and father had an ideal of who he was. They had knowledge of his divinity. It was Joseph that was visited by the angel Gabriel and told that this child is of God. It was, it was Mary who was visited by the angel Gabriel as well and told that she was going to be pregnant without having a man intervene to cause her to become pregnant. Uh, so they had an idea of the divinity of the child. It was Mary who went down to her cousin Elizabeth's house and the baby John leaped in the womb when Mary came into the room. So they had an ideal that this Jesus was not some ordinary character, but he was some special. He was chosen of God for a special mission, but they did not realize, his mother did not even realize who he really was until he rose from the grave. This is when she realized who he really was. And as if rejection wasn't enough, Jesus had the added pressure of despisement. Despisement had its roots in jealousy. Despise, to despise someone, is a deep-seated, unreasonable hatred. You begin to hate the things that they, they like. You begin to hate how they look. You begin to hate how they dress. If they put on something that you used to wear, that you have worn before, you might even go home and throw it away. That's despisement. 
Jesus was despised and he was rejected. As if rejection isn't bad enough. To be despised with your rejection. Which means that we in our walk will be despised. We in our walk will be rejected. But who do you want to be accepted from? By? Do you want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord? Or do you want to hear, that's all right, you did great, buddy. I can't do nothing for you to get you into heaven, but you did great. No, we want to hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant, enter into my joy. But Jesus was despised and rejected by the world. And you're going to be despised, you're going to be rejected by the world system and those who control the world system. But you should take care because you have kinship by him because you are suffering for him. It says that if Christ is going to be lifted up, he's going to be lifted up not just through the celebration of him, but he's going to be lifted up through the suffering that his people do in his name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus was said also to be a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Oh my goodness. Can you imagine being acquainted with grief? I don't want grief on my parents list. I'm sorry. Matter of fact, I want to, if I've got a friend named grief, I want to go on and just delete them off my friendship list. I don't want grief on, but Jesus was acquainted with grief. He knew of grief. This denotes the sorrowful state of the world. The world will give you grief. The rejection along with the despisement of the Lord by the world and assuredly his close relatives rejecting him and despising him. Rejecting him and despising him. To include James, the man who wrote the book of James was a brother of Jesus who did not accept him as the Christ while he was yet in the family while Jesus was going about his three and a half years of ministry, James did not accept him. It wasn't until he had went to the cross, he had died, raised up with all power, that his brother accept that he was Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, but as part of who Jesus is, he became sin for us. He became sin for us. Hallelujah. He took our sins to the cross. He bore our burdens. He took on our burdens of sorrow and despisement and rejection. He took what also adds to the grief of the Savior, what adds to Jesus' grief is when we will not worship, when we just won't worship, when we're giving God patty cakes, that adds to his grief. Our lack of faith brings grief to God Almighty. Jesus' grief is amplified when we do not grow in faith, when we are not graceful or give grace to other people, when we are unthankful, when we will not love, when we will not grow in peace, when we will not grow and practice in our joy. The, 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 the grief of the Lord is aptly, actually amplified because by Him, our sorrows were born. He carried our sorrows. Verse 4 of Isaiah 53 emphasizes this by using a word which is akin to verily, verily. It says, surely, surely he has borne our sorrows. Surely he picked up our pains. Surely he picked up our concerns. Surely because he bore those things, we no longer have to bear those things and suffer through those things the way that we were suffering through those things. Surely uh, he has borne our sorrows. Surely he has borne our grief by having him and by him, rather, by him bearing those sorrows and griefs. We are blessed in two ways. There are two ways that we are truly blessed because he bore those sorrows and griefs. Two ways. The first is griefs and sorrows of this world. This world is not your home, and you should be a stranger just passing through. But this world, one thing this world is guaranteed is going to bring you sorrows. Amen. It's going to bring you troubles. Mm -hmm. The world is going to bring you pain. Mm -hmm. and that's just the world. That's just how it is. Because the God liturgy of this world is that type of person. Mm -hmm. 
He can't bring order to this world, so he brings chaos to this world. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? So, so the first blessing that we receive is griefs and sorrows. The first is griefs and sorrows of the world. We are blessed because Jesus carries those. Mm -hmm. This explains why weeping endure for a season, weeping endure for a night. But he has promised that joy shall return at the appointed time. Hallelujah. Joy shall return at the appointed time. You may be crying this evening about something that you're going through, and your joy may not even return tomorrow morning, but in the morning, that spiritual morning, in the morning, once your morning has come, hallelujah, then you're able to stand up and receive back again that joy. God promised that that joy is going to return. I don't know about you, but I, I would encourage you to be at the at the foot of your heels, looking up at the hills from where it comes at your help. That's why I encourage you to do. Hallelujah. Joy is somehow wired into us. It's wired into us. When you find a Christian that's not full of joy, then there's something wrong. It's something that's not. That, because joy is wired into us. Christians cannot be so heaven bound that there's no earthly good in terms of bringing joy to those around them. Hallelujah. You know, the same Christians who, who should have joy are singing joy to the world. The Lord has come, but there's no joy inside of them. There's a problem with that because we as Christians should emulate joy. We as Christians should exude joy out of every pore of our bodies. Even when we go through things, there should be a hint of joy in us. When we face the death of a loved one and, and, and we know that how crushing that can be, but yet there should be a hint of joy inside of us because we should not grieve as people who do not know the Lord. Grieve. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Joy is, is, is in us though. Joy is, seems to be activated by an inner button at the appointed time and it causes a certain actions outside of us, whereas other people are able to see they still got their joy. When you bless someone else, is a result of that button being pushed. And because you bless someone else, it actually reciprocates in kind and begins to bless you because you bless someone else. Jesus said it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. There's a reason that he said that. Hallelujah. Because he know that that joy button on the inside of you is pushed when you bless someone else. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Nehemiah, the man who built the temple, who built the walls of Jerusalem, uh, captured the phrase of, of joy being reciprocal in us in the phrase he put forth while building the temple. When all around him was not going the best, when his so-called friends, those frenemies, as well as his enemies were all trying to bring discouragement to him. They were bringing discouragement him to him by themselves. They were using other people to bring discouragement to him. When all this was going on, Nehemiah didn't rely on what he saw with his natural eyes. Nehemiah began to, to confess the one phrase that I love to hold on to. He said, the joy of the Lord is my strength. People looking at you saying, how can you go on when all these challenges are coming for you? How can you go on when people mistreat you, when people talk about you? How can you go on when people despitefully use you? How can you go on when you're doing work as unto the Lord? The Lord allows that joy button to be pushed on the inside of you, which allows you to go that extra mile, which allows you to love in spite of being treated a certain kind of way, which allows you to bless those who despitefully use you, which allows you to pray for those who hurt you for no reason at all because the joy of the Lord is your strength. If you rely on the so-called joy of the world, then you won't have strength. The joy of the world may infuse the zeal inside of you, but the passion inside of you is not infused. 
The joy of the world is not something that we should seek. So therefore, we should not seek the approval of the world, but we should seek the approval of God. When we seek the approval of God and God smiles upon us, he has a way of making even your enemies help you when they do not want to, when they do not want you. Oh, my God, my God, my God. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So Nehemiah knew that his, his word brought joy. Because he got strength, because God poured out strength to him because of his work. This was by him. Nehemiah had strength because of the Christ in him. The incarnate Christ that had not come manifest himself physically into the world was the Christ that strengthens him and gave him the ability to go on in spite of the rejection, the despisement, the hate, the hurt, and the things of this world. Hallelujah. There's a scripture in Nehemiah that really encouraged me and shows you the state of mind that Nehemiah had. And it's Nehemiah 9 and 6. It says, Thou, even thou art Lord alone. That's enough to just make you shout right there, but there's more. Thou has made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth, and all things that are there in the seas, and all that is therein. Thou preservest them, and the host of heaven worship thee. This is why I get excited about the scripture. Nehemiah was going through. He had Sanballat, Sanballat and Tobias were really pouring it on him. Sanballat was using Tobias and, and was throwing things at him, sending letters to him, uh, was having people go and vandalize this wall that he was building. They were throwing everything at him to include the kitchen sink. So everything that could be thrown at him was being thrown at him. But yet, in spite of that, he found time to not only say the joy of the Lord is my strength, but he found time to talk about God's power, to talk about God's greatness, to talk about the great creator who created all these great things. Can you imagine? Nehemiah in his mindset probably was saying that if God created the heavens and the earth, then surely he can use me to build this wall. This must be absolutely nothing to him when you compare that to what he has placed in the sea. When you compare it to the stars in heaven worshiping God, this must be nothing to him for him to allow me to build this wall. Oh my God, my God, by him. The next way in which we're blessed is his bearing our sorrows and bearing our griefs. He bore our sorrows and our griefs at the work that he did at the trial. He bore our sorrows and griefs at the work that he did in the persecution that came upon him. He bore our sorrows and griefs in the crucifixion. These things, along with the significance of receiving God's approval, by him getting up. He bore all these things for us. He bore our sorrows and griefs on the cross. He then defeated death and took the authority that death had over mankind. The authority that it had over mankind because of the law. But because of his grace, uh, glory unto God. Because of his grace, bless your name Jesus. Because of his grace that he gives us, it allows us not to perish underneath the law. And we only face the one death, which is a physical death. But we have eternal life through him. Hallelujah. Oh my God, my God. And then Jesus, he returned after he defeated death and took the authority from death. So the death no longer reigned and returned from the grave with the keys of life. This was by him, by him. Verse 5 in Isaiah 53 says this, but he was wounded for our transgressions. Many people know that part of the scripture. Many people know that part of the scripture. You know, they, they, they know the scripture where it says he was wounded for our transgressions, but they don't understand they don't understand what wounded was. They don't understand even what transgressions are. Uh, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. Let's look at two things here. By him. Let me explain once again. Sin compared 
transgressions compared to iniquities. Sins cause us to fall short and all transgressions and iniquities are sin. Some sins are sins of omission, not knowing that you're doing something. But some sins are sins of commission, knowing that you're doing it but refusing to give up doing it. Refusing to give up doing it. Transgressions are a gateway to reprobateness. If you continue in your transgressions, then you cannot be in him, through him, or by him. You cannot continue in your transgressions. Transgressions, like I said, are a gateway to a reprobate mind. And you enter into it from the rebellious heart. When you rebel against God, <laughs> sins of omission and commission rest in the founder of the sin. Huh. When sins of the father are unforgiven, when sins of the father are unforgiven, that is, sins of your forefathers are unforgiven, and carry onward beyond reprobateness and onward to being the norm, then those are iniquities. Those are things that a stronghold rest upon. Strongholds rest upon, strongholds replicate, strongholds help to build iniquities in our lives. And when we have the strongholds holding on, allowing the iniquities a place of rest, and we don't know that it's our place, even though we did not commit the sin, it is still our place to recognize that those sins could be the things that are causing us to be cursed. Causing us to be kept from the blessing of God. The Bible says, it says that I shall visit the sins of the father uh, upon the second, third, and fourth generation. So we have to understand not only our sins of, of, of uh, transgressions, which is things that we do, but the sins of iniquity. We have to understand that we have to repent daily. We have to do our renunciations and state unto the Lord, look, Lord, if there's something that was done by me or by my forefathers, then please forgive me of those things so that those things will not continue to haunt me. And we can only obtain this by his mercy, by him. So, thus sin, recapping, thus sin, when repeated against the knowledge of God, becomes transgressions, which, if it continues long enough, it becomes iniquity. Iniquity eventually perverts the flesh, and your conscience is seared, and you continue in those sins. Mm -hmm. So, in him, through him, and by him. In him, through him, and by him, because of what Jesus has done, it allows us access to the throne of mercy and grace. Because of what Jesus has done, it allows us to, to renounce the things of this world, to renounce lordship of our lives that, that the enemy has held for so long, and announce the lordship of Jesus in our lives. Because he paid the cost of all these things. In him, through him, and by him is about a cost that was paid. A cost that was paid by him. In him, through him. A cost that was paid. So what do we do with this knowledge that we now have? Which is newfound knowledge that we have. First and foremost, get in line with the word of God. Right where you are. I'm not sure what it is that you are going through, but I know that a lot of us are going through. It's the cold and callous and narcissistic person who's not affected or impacted by COVID-19. You may not have lost your job. You may not have lost any money. You may not have lost any relatives, but there are people dying all around us. There are people who lost jobs, who lost homes all around us. There are people who are burying their, their family members all around us. So it's a callous heart that cannot have pity upon that person. So first, return unto Jesus. Ask for forgiveness of sins. Ask him to, to use you in a way where you can help someone else. Return to the joy that Jesus has promised. My friends, as I said, you don't have to die and go to hell. Right where you are, you can repent of your sins and you can be back in him and 
through him things will occur for you. And by him you will make it into the kingdom of God. Let me pray for you right now. Father God, in the name of your son Jesus, we give you glory, praise, and honor. We ask for forgiveness of sins and transgressions, Lord God. We ask, Lord God, that you would bless us, that you would keep us, that you would allow us, Lord God, to grow in the grace which you have so abundantly given unto us, Father. And we thank you right now, Lord God. We intercede right now for this area, for this region, for this state, for this country. We intercede for this world right now, Father God, that, Lord God, that more people would come unto the realization that they need Jesus. And, Lord God, they would repent. Lord God, I thank you right now for an outpouring of your spirit upon all flesh. Because many people, Lord God, are turning unto you. But, Lord God, even in that, I thank you that your mercy, Lord God, has allowed us to be kept. Allowed us, Lord God, to continue to propel forth the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And allow us, Lord God, to grow more in you. It's by your son Jesus' name, in your son Jesus' name, through your son Jesus, that we pray these things. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you, beloved. Thank you for tuning in to our Bible study on this evening. Amen. We're thanking God for the things that he has done. We're praying right now that you continue to be blessed in the Lord. If you desire to be a blessing to Interceding Christian Center, of course, we have our, our faithful uh, membership that's on right now on Messenger. But we also are recording this for Facebook for prosperity's sake. You can be a blessing to Interceding Christian Center by giving to us from the Cash App, which is dollar sign interceding cc dollar sign interceding cc or you can give to the giveify app just go on giveify download it and and look for interceding christian center and you can be a blessing to this ministry to god almighty be the glory great things he has done this is pastor schaefer pastor schaefer the doctor of interceding christian center giving god glory praise and honor for his mercy towards you and asking that you would continue to be a blessing in someone's life around you in jesus name god bless you two of the immutable truths of god is his holiness and his love his love determines his every move john 3 16 the most loved and most well known Yet complexly simple scripture speaks of this love and there is no denying his holiness. All of creation states that it is so. In Genesis 1, the Lord began a work that brought about what we know as creation. Creation, or to be creative in itself, is the nature of God and by default our nature as well. After speaking all these things into being, the Lord turned his focus to the intent of his heart. The crown jewel which he called very good or mankind. The Lord created someone who like him was triune. He gave his expressed image of his creation the authority to mirror and mimic who he is. God bless you beloved. I just read an excerpt out of the book entitled The Stick Man's Understanding, Redemption, Salvation and Blessing. This book is now available on Amazon.com. It's available at Books of Million, Barnes and Nobles and many other venues. And recently has been published in several languages to include uh, languages that we would not even expect it to be published in, but we thank God for the publication of in many languages. And it's also available in digital download form. So you can go and get it on your Kindle and other devices. The Stick Man's Understanding of Redemption, Salvation, and Blessing. Trust me, this will open up your understanding and this will bless your soul. God bless. I pray that you enjoyed the word today and that it touches you within a deep place in your heart and it will spark a change that should come about in your life. If the Lord so touched your heart and you have a desire to give, you can give to this ministry as we continue to make impacts in this city at our Givelify app. Simply download the Givelify app at one of the app or the Google store and look for Interceding Christian Center. Here at Interceding, we aspire to bring people to spiritual knowledge and thus victory. God bless you.